thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk about my research among all these great scientists. Uh, it's been a really great presentations. Uh, I have a short presentation on how we can use X-ray microtomography and, uh, and SCM to study the material of free stride probiotics. Uh, so my name is Shrai Bai, uh, and I'm a PhD student at Lund University. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm working on enhancing the shelf life of probiotics. So uh, my supervisors in this project are Anna Furebi from RICE and uh, Emmanuel Larsson uh, from Lund University. Um, let's see here. So um, this project is divided into two parts. Uh, the first part is um, it's a classic investigation where we look at the structures of free stride material. Uh, we want to determine the parameters such as pore size, uh, pore connectivity, and tortuosity. So all these parameters affect the free stride process and is, um, give us the valuable information on how we should design a free stride process. Other information we can obtain from tomography is the wall thickness and uh, where the bacterial cells are located in this material. Um, so these are parameters that can play an important role when we look at the shelf life of these probiotics. So the second part of the project is much more challenging but more exciting, I think. Um, and that is, uh, we want to investigate the dynamics of the free strain. So um, how are the structures formed? Uh, we study the movement. Um, we study the movement during freezing and uh, also the, the movement that happens during drying. Um, but let us start by looking at the structures formed after freeze drying. Uh, so we can just by looking at these SEM pictures. Um, so these are these are SEM pictures of freeze dried uh, material of an amorphous, amorphous material. In this instant, it's maltodextrin. Um, we can clearly see that there is a difference between the, the structures, but it's not, um, it's not easy to draw any conclusions on pore size or wall thickness. And this is, of course, the reason we need X-ray tomography. I will go into details on what kind of structures we see in these pictures later on. Um, so the first part of our experiment, um, where we look at the structures, was pre performed at the Division of Solid Mechanics at Lund University. Uh, so the equipment we used here is an, uh, an X-ray lab tomograph from SAIS. Uh, and it's a state-of-the-art, very, very good equipment. Uh, after scanning, we obtained slices of freeze-dried material that we can build up to obtain a 3D image of, of this uh, structure. Uh, so after obtaining this 3D image um, of the free stride cake, we need to analyze the structure. Uh, so here we have three different, uh, three different free stride structures from three different um, free striding protocols. Uh, in short, the first structure on the left is free stride at the low temperature and the middle one is done at a little bit higher temperature. And the one to the right has undergone an annealing process. Um, I should also emphasize that it's important to do a proper preparatory work uh, to remove noise and interference and to set the proper threshold to ensure that all the materials are included. <clears throat> so not until then can we start analyzing the structure. Um, but let us uh, start by looking at the pore size of these free stride material. Um, so the pore size is analyzed using a method called water segmentation or water shedding. Uh, and we can see the different pores represented by the different colors here. Um, but it's still quite difficult to see any major differences between the structures. So what we can do is um, we plot um, the amount of pores with the equivalent diameter and we obtain a graph that looks something like this. So by looking at these graphs, we can see that the, the difference between the first and second sample is not that significant, uh, while the third sample contains uh, larger pores. Um, it's, it should be noticed that this is uh, plotted to the amount. Maybe we should plot to a volume, then we, we will see a clearer difference. Um, so the larger pore size should lead to a smaller surface area. Uh, in, and that leads to, 
smaller surface area means that it's, it's means in turn that it's a thicker material. And uh, this is something we can confirm uh, by analyzing the local thickness. Um, so looking at the local thickness here, uh, we can see that um, the thin parts here are colored purple and the thicker parts are colored uh, uh, red and yellow. And as expected, the difference between the first and second sample is not that noticeable, while the third samples clearly have a thicker material, so confirming our, our hypothesis. Um, this is very valuable information when we want to investigate how, how structures can influence the shelf life of probiotics. Um, but all these samples has, has been done to a finished uh, finish product, uh, a free strike product. And if we want to understand how these structures are created, uh, we need to study the movement during free strike. And here comes the second uh, exciting part of our study. Uh, so we have thought uh, long and hard on how the materials move during free strain and have come up with a hypothesis, um, a, a hypothesis that can potentially be confirmed using X-ray microtomography. So I have made this short illusion, uh, illustration on how we think free strain works. Uh, so we have a, a state diagrams of sugar water system, a typical free drying program, and an illusion on uh, uh, illustration on how we think uh, the movements um, happens. Uh, I will not go into detail, but to sum it up, we think that the, there is a structure formed during freezing. Uh, we call that the primary structure. Uh, but to be able to dry the sample, the primary structure needs to be connected and create the path to the vacuum. Uh, so this movement creates another structure called the secondary structure uh, that consists of pores that is connected to each other and out to the vacuum. Um, so if we can invest investigate the movement of ice crystals and the material, uh, we can confirm or invalidate this theory. Um, but there is, uh, this is a challenging task and we have few hurdles to overcome. Um, all right, so uh, the, the, the first hurdle is to build a free dryer that can work inside the beamline and moreover have a representative sample environment. Uh, here you can see a prototype of a mini free dryer uh, that probably fits in the, in the, in the beamline. Uh, other challenges is to get the contrast between sugar and ice. Um, and also to have enough, fast enough imaging uh, that we can record the movement. Uh, so let's look at these challenges in, in detail. Mm, so we have worked a lot with free strike and we have quite a good idea on how a free stride amorphous material looks like when we free stride them in, in a vial. Uh, but when we tested our sample environment, it, quite, it turned out quite differently. Um, so up here, you can see this, um, this structure that we are used to. And here, uh, here is the tomography picture of, uh, uh, of our sample environment, uh, free stride in our sample environment. Uh, so this kind of structure is a typical phenomenon called directional supercooling. And uh, this kind of structure um, um, are more connected and can easily create the path to the vacuum, resulting that we um, they keep their primary structure and preventing the movement to form the secondary uh, structure. Uh, so this is a phenomenon unusual in the ordinary free strain, uh, even if we see it sometimes, uh, but this is something that we want to avoid. So there's a challenge on, on how we should um, uh, how we should design our sample environment. And if we see a uh, water segmentation of, of this sample, it's, uh, we can see that it looks very, very different from, from a sample from a vial. Um, yes, the other challenges we have is to obtain a contrast between sugar and water in the absorption range. Uh, so in this graph here, we see the, um, 
uh, the linear attenuation coefficient plotted against the energy. So to obtain a good contrast between sugar and water, we need to have a difference between, between these. And as you can see, this only happens at the lower energy levels. Um, and this can, of course, cause trouble when we need, uh, for example, a high flux to achieve a uh, short exposure time. Uh, we might, uh, there's possibility that we can overcome this problem by using phase contrast imaging. Uh, but at the end, it's, uh, it's a trade-off in exposure time in order to maximize the contrast um, and at the same time minimizing the sample blurring. Um, but all in all, uh, we have uh, a fun and challenging uh, experiments to look, look, uh, look, uh, to look ahead of us. Um, and it's going to be very exciting to, to see what uh, a synchrotron can provide for our, our experiments. Um, that's all for me. Uh, I would like to thank my supervisors, Anna Furebi and Emanuel Larsson for all the help and support. Uh, I would also like to thank BioGaia for funding my PhD project and of course to Vinova that is funding this, this project. All right, uh, and questions? There was at least one in the chat here from Tommy. Um, Tommy asked, does the interfacial zone during drying look different from the bulk in your system? Uh, say that again. In, uh, yeah. I can see the chat. Yeah, okay. Uh, interfacial zone, what do you mean by interfacial zone? Tommy, can you elaborate? Yeah, I, I just mean when you you do your drying, yes. you, you create an interface as you you uh, you have your solution and there is an interface uh, with air or mm -hmm. air, and then you freeze the whole thing, and uh, it starts to dry. I'm just curious because when you do ordinary freeze drying, the 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 top often look a little bit different from the from the bulk, so to speak. Yeah, I is see. That, is that, so do you see something like that? And, uh, and yeah. have you looked into that? That you should be able to monitor in your images. Yes, so we see, we see quite a big difference between the absolute top layer of, of the free stride cake. But the bulk and the bottom uh, keeps, if it's a well-designed free stride probe, program, uh, there's no difference within the bulk. So there's no difference between upper layer and, and further down the sample. But the top looks very different from, from the rest of the cake. Um, and and uh, we have actually quite a, a challenging, we, we don't really understand how the structures on the top are formed because um, it sometimes looks like just a sheet uh, sometimes it's very porous. Uh, sometimes it's uh, elongated pores. Uh, we don't know if these structures are are uh, originated from the freezing or from the drying part. Um, mm. Yes. So, so because I guess when you, at least when you do ordinary freeze drying, it often seems that the top layer is harder if you want to dissolve it again. It, it's much more mm. challenging. Yeah, so it would be interesting to look into. Yeah, um, we are not we, in the second part of a project where we look at the movement. We're not for, uh, so when we talk about the top layer, we talk about the top layer of the material. So th then, then there's a top layer of uh, where the drying happens. That is called the sublimation front, and and that's where. Uh, the movements um, are interesting for us to look at because we think that that part um, at the sublimation front uh, will determine a lot of the, the parameters we look at. Um, that's where the movement happens, let's say. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Tommy. Um, yeah, can I ask, uh, so so what is the, the time scale you're measuring on? You, you were doing time resolved uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, yeah. how, how long does it take to make uh, one of your, your scans? Uh, that is something we have not uh, gone into. The, the freeze drying process per se, we can decide to be faster or slower. Uh, so, but um, 
but to record this movement in this small small scale it can be very challenging but we we of course want to have we want to find a, a, a beam line that has the highest highest amount of flux uh, at our at our um, energy level uh, so basically we we uh, we want to maximize the the, the um, exposure uh, minimize the exposure time uh, as much as we can without without losing the contrast uh, yeah um, uh, should I Emmanuel here maybe I can yes. give some yes. details Clear so the, <laughs> the, the the scans that were showed here uh, that you saw they they took rough uh, roughly I would say we, we really pushed the resolution so with the lab scan it took around nine hours actually okay uh, but uh, I mean, this is in a lab-based environment. If you go to synchrotron, you have higher flux, so, so you will be able to image much faster, let's say. Yeah. But um, and exposure time, I would need to double check, but I think it was between five and 12 seconds or something. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so let me just comment that the, the reason I'm asking is because uh, together with a colleague, uh, Martin Kramer Pedersen at the Niels Bohr Institute, we, we have some new analysis tool using computational topology and we're quite interested in to, to getting some uh, time resolved tomography data from food based systems. So maybe I'll send you an email about that. Oh, sure. That would be really appreciated. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, one last question, maybe then. Uh, I assume there will be a, a neutron tomography beamline at the ESS. Would that help you? Oh, we talked about uh, neutron tomography. I think yeah, we we landed on X-ray tomography. Uh, the the exact reason should I I, I should maybe refer this question to Emmanuel again. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So I mean, we we basically concluded that for for this application for this uh, free stride products, we need basically sub micrometer resolution. Yeah. Uh, so let's say zero point eight microns or so. And uh, I mean, if we go to a neutron tomography, current state of the art is more around 10-ish uh, microns currently. But uh, if we wait a couple of years yeah. or so, maybe we can, <laughs> we'd be happy to explore as a neutron tomography for this application. So uh, yeah, that's okay. basically it. Yep. Thank you for your replies, both of you, and uh, for your talk, John. Very nice. Uh